and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, sovereignty, China and the U.S. lock horns over missile deployments on China's Xisha Islands in the South China Sea. Privacy versus security. Apple takes on the FBI as U.S. authorities seek backdoor access to iPhone of one of the same Bernardino shooters. We begin today's show with China's latest statement on the South China Sea issue, this time about the missile deployment on China's Xisha Islands. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi on Wednesday said that deploying limited and necessary national defense facilities on China's own territory has nothing to do with militarization in the South China Sea. But U.S. officials disagree, anticipating serious conversations on this issue in the near future. The missile deployment on Yongxing Island has drawn criticism from the United States. China's foreign ministry is defending the deployment as nothing new and that China is acting entirely within its sovereign rights. For the past decades, China has been deploying homeland defense facilities to the Xisha Islands. This is nothing new. We hope that certain countries would not deliberately play it up, but do more for the interests of regional peace and stability. Earlier this week, U.S. President Barack Obama hosted ASEAN leaders at a summit in California. Tensions in the South China Sea and the importance of freedom of navigation were major points of discussion. But ultimately, the summit's joint statement added only a new commitment to non-militarization to the existing policy position. However, the U.S. has continued to express concern over China's actions and what they see as a militarization of the region. Well, we have said repeatedly with respect to China that uh, the standard that should be applied to all countries with respect to the South China Sea is no militarization. But there is every evidence every day that there has been an increase of militarization of one kind or another. Uh, it's a serious concern. Despite disputes between China and other claimants, all sides agree that dialogue is the key to a peaceful resolution. China has undertaken actions to give goods and services to the international community and also play its positive role there. China is vowing to work with all parties concerned to ensure peace and stability in the region. For more about the Xisha Island debate, we are joined here in the Beijing studio, Yang Xiyu, who is a senior fellow from the China Institute of International Studies, and also here with us, uh, Mr. Jiang Junshe, senior captain and vice president of the Naval Research Institute in China. Welcome to both of you gentlemen in Beijing. Also joining us from Washington, D.C., we're having Mr. Douglas Paul, who is the vice president of Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Welcome to the three of you. First of all, Senior Captain Zhang, you might want to help us to understand why China is busy deploying land-to-air missiles in the Xisha Islands. Well, first of all, I want to say that the Xisha Islands are an uh, inherent part of China's so, uh, territory. So it is natural and also legitimate for China to deploy limited defense weapons and facilities on these islands. Uh, this action is blameless and falls within uh, China's sovereign rights and international law. What, what, those, what, what have been those weapons for? Targeting at whom? Well, I think uh, it doesn't have uh, has any specific target. It is uh, natural for any country to deploy defensive weapons on their islands. They are just, uh, want, they are just aimed at better protecting China's sovereignty and security. Okay, we hear from the Chinese side. What about from the U.S. side, Mr. Paul? There has been a lot of discussion about what are those for? Those uh, U.S. Uh, military planes and also ships uh, in the territory which many countries consider as uh, sensitive. What are they for? Well, it's hard to say. Um, we have a situation where uh, China says too little about what its intentions are and in America we say too much about everything we see. Uh, the consequence has been that people watch the incremental developments whether in the Sisha Paracel Islands or in the uh, Spratly uh, Nansha Islands and see a creeping, an incremental approach that China is trying to militarize the entire South China Sea. 
China has not stated what its ultimate objective is. It's been very uh, obtuse about this, and therefore people who are suspicious of China project the worst image that they can imagine. And therefore, what are the U.S. warships and military aircraft in the region for? That's also my question to you, sir. Well, they're they're there because one, the local. Uh, countries with which we have、uh, good relations have asked us to be there. Two, the U.S. on principle throughout the world conducts freedom of navigation exercises. Those have come under、uh, greater pressure politically in the U.S. because there is a suspicion that China is trying to close off the South China Sea, not today, not tomorrow, but pretty soon. And therefore, the argument is that if the U.S. doesn't keep those passageways open, China will close them. All right. Mr. Yang here in Beijing.、Mm -hmm. Well, does China have a hidden agenda, as Mr. Paul suspect uh, uh, earlier? And also,、uh, what does China think about so-called the freedom of navigation from the U.S. side? Well, I should say by, by this way. On one hand, China has a modern, modernization plan, as everyone knows, including military、uh, modernization. Uh, regarding to the weapon deployment on Shisa Island and Nansha Island, it has been years. For example, many years ago, the PLA deployed、uh, anti-aircraft guns at that time. But now we modernized, upgrade to missile. It's natural. It's a natural course for every sovereign、uh, state. And on the other hand, in recent years,、uh, U.S. Speed up their militarization by sending more and more frequently aircraft and uh, warships. Uh, uh, like my friends、uh, Doug Paul pointed out, uh, under uh, requirement of the neighboring countries, that regarded by China as a changing position of American policies. That was take no position on the dispute. But、mm. now U.S. began to take a position, especially take a position by military means. That for China is really, really、uh, uh, militarization. China has to do some reaction. Well, Mr. Paul, you know, it seems that China believes it is natural evolution of the weapons on Shisha and Nansha Islands. And second, U.S. might, from China's perspective. Begin this、uh, so-called arms race in the region. At least that's what some of the Chinese pilots with us uh, believe. Uh, what do you? How do you respond? Well, I, I, I'm a specialist on this region, and I see the arguments on both sides on a regular basis. And both sides have some merit to the cases that they make. What we have here really is the emerging security dilemma. Where China does something which it believes is de defensive in nature, and it's perceived by its neighbors as potentially offensive, and then we on the other side do something we perceive as defensive, and China perceives it as offensive. Another example would be in South Korea, where the U.S. believes it has to defend itself against North Korean missiles by deploying THAAD. And China sees the THAAD air defense system as offensive against China's capabilities. We need our leaderships to sit down together and give each other some reassurances about what their long-term intentions are.、Uh, China has a big gap in its explanation for what the nine-dash line means and what it intends to do、uh -huh. about enforcing the、uh, territorial claims in the South China Sea. As a start, Mr. Zhang, senior captain. Is it a perspective issue? Well, I think、uh, this can, can, there are two points in this question. First,、uh, I agree with Mr. Paul that China has never and、uh, now is not blo blocking the passage of、uh, free trade or、uh, the passage of any vessels in the South China Sea. And I don't think the United States should make its decision or judgment on hypothesis that China will probably in the future block the passage. This is only a hypothesis. So just on this hypothesis, on the basis, the United States is sending its warplanes and air,、uh, aircraft、uh, into the territorial waters of China in the South China Sea. It's ridiculous. And what about、uh, the perspective issue? You believe that only hypothesis. It is not reality, and yet U.S. has already taken action. And also, the Shisha Island is totally different from the Nansha Islands.、Mm. We know that China has、uh, administered and controlled the、uh, Shisha Island for a long time. 
and there is no dispute uh, over the uh, Seashell Island. And I think the United States is trying to provoke tensions in this area, and so as to uh, meddle in the South China Sea issue and maintain its leadership in this uh, region. Okay, that is perspective from both sides. What about history? Uh, Mr. Paul already mentioned the nine dash lines that has been a topic that's been discussed for decades, if not longer. Uh, can we be able to solve it, nine dash line, at this moment uh, during the intense discussion about who is militarized, quote unquote, the region? Well, uh, or is it going to make it, things even worse, uh, okay. more difficult? Uh, too long words to talk about uh, history, but just uh, one simple fact. In 1947, after World War II, when Japanese uh, returned uh, uh, all islands in South China Sea to China, and at that time, Chinese government had uh, no capability to send troops on the major island of uh, uh, Islands. It was the United States Navy. Mm. That helped the Chinese Navy send troops on the Taiping Island. That is the key island. That's just like a, a master room in the house. The master room occupied and returned to China. That means the whole house returned to China. That is history. So when uh, I really agree with my uh, friend, say both Chinese and the American top leaders should sit down, seriously talk about the dash line and everything else ar around in the uh, South China Sea. But so what if they cannot reach any conclusion? Is this uh, tension continue to to uh, appear in front of us, uh, which is likely to be the case that it's not yeah. easy to reach a conclusion? Yeah, I even don't, with the top yeah. leadership are sitting down with yeah, one yeah, another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't expect uh, the top leader of the two sides can reach some agreement or consensus. However, at least at the, at the top level, they can make a trans strategic transparency that can reduce mutual suspicions. Mm -hmm. For example. Uh, you as uh, absolutely suspicious about China's uh, capability to block the, the area, and the Xi Jinping can make a, just like a strategic reassurance. And also, China has a maybe stronger suspicion about American warships, and the President Obama. Uh, should give some re uh, transparency and the real truth. Well, well you, you already mentioned a very sensitive figure, President Obama, because this is a, a, a political figure inside the United States, which would stay, who would stay in the office for another uh, couple of months uh, before he leaves. And Mr. Paul, you know this better than I do. You are based in Washington. Campaign season up, and also uh, even during the transitional year, let's just say next year, it's going to be still difficult to figure out clear policies from the American politics toward this part of the world. Uh, what do you think about the possibility, as you earlier suggested, Mr. Paul, that the two top leadership sit down one another, give reassurances to one another? Well, that's, that's an important objective. It may be difficult under the circumstances. Uh, I think Senior Captain Zhang has made a very important point about transparency. Uh, one of the reasons that we have this uh, discussion this morning is that the Western world was surprised when it was discovered that missiles were placed in the Xisha Paracel Islands. Um, if China had made a programmatic statement about its plans for upgrading defenses in the islands and just published it in its own newspapers, the world would not have been surprised by this development. And then you wouldn't get uninformed reactions from people like the Secretary of State who was uh, asked about it un without expectation at a press conference and gave a response which was based not on the new facts but on his uh, observation of President Xi Jinping's visit in Washington last year when President Xi said he had no intention of militarizing the uh, Nansha Spratly Islands. Mm -hmm. And they were confusing the Xisha and the Nansha in this case. But the long-term intention is still murky and that's where transparency will help. Senior John, uh, Senior Captain Zhang has, has made a very important point. We need to be more transparent, even if our leaders can't sit down and reassure each other. But if on the basis of transparency, we, we might get to better reassurances. All right. Earlier you said it's probably a perspective issue. And now uh, one more question about transparency. But is transparency likely to solve the problem if political leadership at the very top from both countries not likely to act or at least to listen to one another very closely? Uh, will the military be able to be transparent? Transparent one step further, Mr. Zhang, well, Senior Captain Zhang, I want to have your opinion. Well, I think China has been transparent on the South China Sea issue. First, on the um, Sea Island, the China uh, says that 
uh, the, the deployment of limited uh, defense weapons is just for defensive uh, in, uh, for, uh, to safeguard China's sovereignty. On the, so on the national islands, the Chinese uh, construction activities are mainly for civilian purposes. I think the United States should listen to, the, to China mm. uh, about what they, uh, it is saying. Mr. Uh, Paul, can't, why just can't the United States listen to China? Uh, Senior Captain John is complaining certainly here in our Beijing studio. Can you? I, I, I don't know if you've lost contact with me or not. I'll uh, we have you. We have you here, here sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. The, um, the, the U.S. is responding to new events w for which they were unprepared. Uh, there was uh, no earlier reference to this development and no explanation to the government, and therefore they responded based on the most recent developments, as I mentioned in the September meeting here in Washington with the two presidents. Mm. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem of getting ahead of the news not letting the news be made by outside sources. This is a bigger problem every day with all of the social media and alternative sources of information that pop up in public consciousness before officials have a chance to understand and uh, relate policy to these developments. Well, it's not surprising, Mr. Paul, I have to say, as a member of the media, that all of you gentlemen come back to the issue of the media <laughs> of this discussion. But let me go back to you, uh, uh, Mr. Yang, here in Beijing. Seriously, what can the two countries do, even at a time of uh, political turbulence inside the United States? Let's say the two countries seem to enjoy very similar goals, mm -hmm. peace and stability, yep. trade benefits, yeah. exchanges with the countries in the region. Yeah, even freedom of passage. Even freedom of passage and navigation. But why can't the two be able to figure out a common path toward a apparently similar goal? What can be done? Well, first thing is the reduction of the mutual strategic suspicions by uh, more uh, uh, exchanges between the two sides. And the secondly, just uh, clear up what does it mean by the transparency? Mm -hmm. through, through my diplomatic career, I have felt uh, whenever we talk about transparency, we blame each other against each other. Uh, U.S., in my view, transparency may, mainly at a technical uh, level. For example, how many missiles are, are you there, Sea uh, Island? But for China, what about your strategy towards South China Sea? Do you want to contain China? contain Chinese Navy within Sha Sam Si, prevent the Chinese Navy from going out of China Sea. So we have a lot of mm. suspicions. Not just transparency about the so-called realities on the ground, but yeah, also but transparency the about the strategy and yeah, strategic yeah. goals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, we, uh, we should uh, define the, the scope and the level of the quality and the content of transparency and then do something basically likely to okay. talk about uh, to talk about to do about uh, transparency. Mr. Paul, you see, things are becoming really complicated, even just among the three panelists with us here, uh, both in Washington and Beijing. We have to figure out interpretations of many f t terminologies. What is the freedom of navigation? What does it really mean? What are the obligations of various countries involved? What exactly is transparency? What are the obligations of everybody? And also, what is a militarization when one accused the other of doing so? Uh, so many terminologies. I'm confused. Uh, Mr. Paul, you're probably much smarter than I am. I don't know. I, it's not a matter of how smart you are. There's plenty to be confused about. In the last uh, couple of weeks, the very respected organization, the Center for Strategic International Studies here in Washington, has published two reports, both of which are, argue that China, through successive actions of the PLA Navy and Air Force, is trying to turn the South China Sea into a Chinese lake. This is getting widespread attention. And it's even now uh, on the editorial page of today's Economist from the London Economist, which is a very respected journal, mm -hmm. saying the U.S. needs to do more to stop this from happening. Um, this is this is not the way I think the facts are leading. It's but it's the way perceptions are going. And as I said at the very outset of your program, China needs to explain more, and the U.S. needs to say less. And get officials need to get together and try to get an understanding of what a lot of these terms mean. Is it all about words or more than that? 
Mr. Zhang? Well, I think the so-called <laughs> freedom <laughs> of navigation operations conducted by the U.S. military have been a kind of muscle uh, flexion and also have pr uh, uh, have pull, uh, all, uh, have, have given uh, much influence in this area. I right. think they should stop such kind of provocations in this area. Uh, these kind of ac actions are really a kind of muscle flexing and also a threat to the peace stability. They mm. should stop this. Well, what can be done? I want to have the wisdom of the three of you gentlemen. You are coming from various perspectives, from different trades. So let's talk about what can be done. One sentence, if you can. Let's start with Senior Captain Zhang. Well, I think the U.S. should respect China's uh, concern and China's uh, sovereign rights and stop making such kind of provocative actions. Okay. Well, Mr. Paul, one sentence for you. Well, this is a new area. We've been doing freedom of navigation exercises in the Taiwan Strait and elsewhere without this kind of noise level. And it's a question of being transparent about our intentions and uh, letting China get accustomed to the fact that we're not going to use these to uh, violate Chinese sovereignty. Will China and it's going to take a little time to understand. Mm, will China be accustomed to that and will time be allowed? Uh, well, I think one more sentence from you. More, is, uh, more important is uh, just, uh, just put this uh, heated up uh, issue into the SNED as one of the sub, uh, uh, strategic uh, economic, economic dialogues between the two, two sides set up the uh, subject into the dialogue and even wo uh, set up working groups to specifically deal with this issue. Very interesting. A lot of ideas flying around in our discussion. Not to be discussed further. But for now, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Yang Xiyu, Zhang Junshu, joining us in Beijing. And also Douglas Paul, joining us from Washington, D.C. Really appreciate it, gentlemen. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Stay with us here on World Inside. We've got our final segment coming right up. Privacy versus security. Apple takes on the FBI as U.S. authorities seek backdoor access to the iPhone of one of the San Bernardino shooters. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside on CCTV News, coming to you live from Beijing. Apple is going up against the FBI in a battle that could have major implications for U.S. privacy rights. Apple has been ordered by the courts to help the government to break into a locked iPhone of one of the San Bernardino shooters. Apple has refused, claiming to protect the privacy of their users base as a whole. But with national security so-called clashing with individual rights, controversy is bound to ensue regardless of the outcome. The San Bernardino shooting shook America last December. The mass killing of 14 people, with 22 more injured, ended with both shooters killed by the police. In the aftermath, FBI investigators want access to the perpetrator's iPhone data. But it will take cooperation from Apple to break through the encryption. Uh, they are not asking Apple to redesign its product uh, or to create a new back door to one of their products. Uh, they're simply asking for uh, something that would have an impact on this one device. The Department of Justice and the FBI can count on the full support of the White House. The FBI can't guess the PIN code, and if they get it wrong ten times, the phone might wipe everything from the system. The authorities have now obtained a court order compelling Apple to help them gain access. However, Apple CEO Tim Cook said in a strongly worded letter that he would challenge the court's request, writing, if the government can use all the Ritz Act to make it easier to unlock your iPhone, it would have the power to reach into anyone's device to capture their data. National security is of great importance, but many also believe that if the FBI get their way, that everyone's privacy is at risk. If Apple's right, and if this technology ends up getting disclosed, then their privacy and all the information on their iPhone could be at risk. You could be at risk for losing your personal privacy on your medical information, on your banking information. Even your bank security may be at risk. This isn't just an issue with Apple. Every tech company wants customers to trust that their data is safe. Facebook and Twitter are supporting Apple in what's quickly becoming a major clash between the authorities and the tech sector. The battle lines are now drawn as American society once again examines the proper balance between security and individual rights. 
For more about the battle between Apple and the FBI, we are joined in the United States by two panelists. First of all, in Washington, D.C., we have uh, Dr. Ernest McDuffie, founder and CEO of Global McDuffie Group. He originally worked uh, for the U.S. government. Meanwhile, joining us uh, in Los Angeles, we are having Mr. Eric Schiefer, who is the CEO of Patriarch Equity. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. We all know the story now. FBI wanted Apple to break its back door in order to get the information in the iPhones of one of the San Bernardino shooters. Uh, Apple wanted to file an opposition. Which side are you on? Uh, let's go to Ernest first. So it, it's a very interesting uh, debate. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly come down on the side of uh, rule of law. I, I think um, we kind of overstate uh, the issue when we make it all about the, uh, the privacy of individuals uh, versus uh, the government in general. It's a very specific case that's looking to address a very specific issue. It, it certainly comes down to trust. Uh, do the American people trust the government? or do the American people trust the tech giants? Mm. What is the kind of rule of law, Ernest, that you are referring to? You might want to clarify. Well, certainly um, the FBI had to get a warrant. Uh, they had to go through due process. They had to uh, uh, show that there was a need to do what they've done. In the past, uh, I think it's been reported widely in the media here, some 70 times over the last few years, these same procedures have gone through without any incident or uh, report in the media where um, uh, Apple and other uh, companies have complied uh, as they should with uh, these types of uh, requests. Mm. What about you, Eric? Which side are you on? Is it an issue, quote unquote, blown out of proportion, as Ernest early said? Well, I think Ernest makes a lot of really good points. Frankly, in my opinion, I fall on the side of protecting the American people. I think we're, we're at war here with a, a group, frankly, that is affecting not only the United States, but Europe and actually Asia. So I think we need to do a little bit more to protect our people. And in this case, this is a very limited case, in, fra in fact, as Ernest brings up. And really, Apple has been complying with the FBI on a lot of different requests for information. This is really, in my opinion, much more about public relations and also setting a precedent. And they're concerned that if they flex here that the FBI may make them uh, or the government would make them potentially flex on uh, a much larger set of security issues, which could be a backdoor, which, yes, that could open things up potentially to uh, less security, and that's really the issue here. But it's much more about branding because they've been flexing for some time. Mm. But Eric, one question is very important. This is not just about the credibility of a company, whether it's Apple or Google or some of the others. It's about what does it mean when you're using a modern device and how much of your private information is likely to be explored by the government without being notified not just the two so-called shooters in the San Bernardino case, but rather what about the rest of the public? That is the issue that people have been arguing about. On that point, without necessarily talking about credibility of Apple or not, what do you make of this very specific case and its relation with so-called protection of individual rights inside the U.S. and even beyond? Well, look, so, everyone. So I go back uh, to the. Should we go to Eric in America, first? Then? Yeah. I, oh, okay. Go ahead, Eric. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, in my opinion, everyone is ultimately concerned with their own privacy. I mean, there's no question about it. But at some point, you have to find a balance. In this case, it's so limited to this one specific phone. And yes, you could create some type of public relations precedent, no question. But I think ultimately what you're going to find is there'll be some resolution between Silicon Valley and, uh, the, and the White House and the, White, and, and the Obama administration in figuring out how do you balance these things when it comes to terrorism. No one's saying that, that the government should have 
uh, wholesale ability to be able to listen in on calls and mm. access any phone. We're talking about with judicial oversight, and certainly privacy advocates will say, well, look, if you put the government even a little bit in, then they're going to take a mile. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that there could be controls. It's been happening for a while anyway with unique sub subpoenas. So again, I come down on protecting the American people with very limited uh, government intervention right. in cases in which the, a judge or, or someone overseeing it has approved it. Okay. Since both of you seem to be relatively on one side, I have to do the counter argument whether I believe or not as a journalist. So I have to go to you, uh, Ernest. Uh, uh, earlier we heard Eric talking about PR precedents, but whose judgment is it? I mean, whether it is quote unquote a PR precedence or a rule of law precedence or a privacy precedence. This could be an extremely important uh, case, whether Apple is a credibility uh, company at all. That's not important. It, what is more important is about how people's privacy should be protected. What kind of responsibilities companies should have when they are selling their products to their customers. Well, from my standpoint, one there's two sides, the government side and the private sector side. One side has the obligation uh, to protect rule of law and, and, and its citizens, uh, particularly in this uh, environment they're in, that we're in, and that's the government. The other side is private sector, and their motivation is profit. I mean, it's a capitalist society. Uh, they're in business to make money. They need to protect their brand. They need to think that they need to have the public believe uh, that the uh, products that they're selling do what they advertise to do. And the government's not opposed to that. I mean, the government supports that. That's why they go through uh, the rule of law. That's why the raw laws are in place. And you have to get a uh, judge and third parties to agree uh, before the government can go in and do any of these kind of things that they're trying to do. So, so it's kind of clear. I, I worry much more about private companies uh, stealing my personal information for profit mm -hmm. uh, to resell it to other people to attest, and I do about the government well, listening to my phone calls. Well, well, Ernest, we have to say probably those are the same devil or two different devils. Yet you can be consider yeah. uh, con, uh, con, uh, concerned about one is probably a government getting your information through the companies, and the other is the companies getting your information and throw it elsewhere, which you don't know. So we are not saying. Apple is important, Pear is not. We're saying both of them are important. But what about this specific case? This is the, what we are talking about here. Eric, let's come back to this very specific case. What about the tech community? What do you make of a relatively united uh, attitude at this time uh, from the tech community? How do you compare the situation now, let's just say, before, with the, before the Snowden revelation. Uh, does that play a key role in the public's realization of their privacy? And what does that mean for the credibility of the tech companies? And therefore, this is a struggle between the tech community and the government. It's a long question, but Eric, I have to put everything very clearly out there. I got it. Okay. So look, with Snowden, it changed the game because at this point, the American public was so I think, uh, demoralized by what they found out uh, with the revelations with Snowden. So it made companies have to adhere to a much higher standard in terms of how they perceived uh, information that was coming and, and involving their customers. And they really had to go an extra mile because people lost trust. They lost trust in organizations. They obviously lost trust in the government. That has changed the game. and so. I think what's, what you're seeing is that unless you're an aggressive advocate, unless you're really out front in terms of protecting the rights of consumers and their privacy, you're looked on in a negative way, almost in a, in a, a way that the Snowden paint painted the government. And so 
that's what I think you're seeing more of. Again, it's about brand protection. And brands right now, the, the smart, politically correct thing to do, frankly, from, from a, a, a company perspective, is to be aggressive in terms of protecting the consumer. All right. That's, what's out, that's really what Apple is doing. I think you're seeing this clearly. But what's wrong, quote unquote, with the brand protection, whether it's a PR, PR stunt or it is a real concern about the privacy. What's the matter with it? It doesn't really matter to the consumers as long as this company are trying to protect, at least in this case or others, the rights and privacy of the consumers. Their intention is one thing. One could never be able to tell very clearly what the intentions are. Nobody could each read each other's minds. But what is important is what about the results, Eric? That's what's important, isn't it? Well, look, I think there's a whole other side to this, which is there are a lot of people in America, certainly, and around the world that would say, look, security, especially when you're at war with a terrorist organization, these are thugs. These are bad guys. These are not good guys. And they want to destroy America. They want to destroy parts of Europe and, and anyone that's against their caliphate. So I think that it changes things for a lot of people that want security. And they're saying, look, in these limited cases, give the government what they need to go after the bad guys and and frankly i tend to agree with them i think all that right. you've got to i i don't think that apple has a right to be able to hold it back all right ernest this is a very interesting situation what we are seeing right now both of you have been talking uh, on and off uh, about uh, consumers we see a very interesting picture here the government could file these kinds of court orders, uh, uh, to file these kind of things uh, toward a company and court orders can be issued and company could file opposition against the government. And yet there's a really weak party. The weak party is the consumers. They also have another name, citizens. So on the one hand, their security has to be guaranteed, the citizen security. On the other hand, the consumer's privacy also have to be guaranteed. Will they always be contradictory to one another, Ernest? What can be the solutions? You know, I, I really don't think that there's a, a conflict directly between security and privacy. Uh, cybersecurity is actually the enabler of privacy. You know, proper cybersecurity, cyber hygiene is what enables citizens and individuals to have some sense of privacy at all. So, you know, I don't think that, I think that's like a, a false uh, dichotomy there. Um, you, you have to do it right. And I, I agree completely with Eric. The, uh, the idea that this uh, branding somehow trumps uh, the physical security of the entire country is uh, ludicrous. You know, I think uh, the law and the courts will come down on the side of the government, particularly in this limited, in this limited case. Uh, when they kind of talk about this uh, slippery slope, if we do this here, it's going to lead to something greater. Well, I, I don't believe that that's a, a true concern either. Technology will continue to evolve and uh, advance. It, it becomes the challenge of the um, lawmakers and the uh, citizens to stay uh, current. Uh, with what's available and what the products are really doing. Right. That's an interesting question, isn't it, uh, Eric? Uh, because whose security is it? Who should be able to define what is security? And in order to secure security, what have to be done? Who is right is it to define that? And meanwhile, what about privacy? Who is there to defend the privacy as we are seeing bigger voices coming from business community, bigger voices coming from the government? It seems private citizens are really the weaker party here. Look, I'm a privacy advocate. At the same time, I believe in protecting the country. And when you have reports of ISIS now getting dirty bombs or potentially dirty bombs because of, uh, ra because of what may be leaked or have stolen in Iraq, it makes the stakes that much bigger. And the information on this phone could lead to information that could stop these kinds of things. So I think that with limited controls, and, and in, certainly in this limited case, the government absolutely should be protecting its citizens. When you could be talking about a, a disaster that could affect hundreds of thousands of people, I don't think that 
uh, limited right. uh, limited privacy intrusion on this case uh, should should stop that. This is not necessarily going to create a precedent. This is much more about public relations than law per se. Well, you say you are a one uh, advocating for privacy and also uh, citizens' rights. Uh, at least that that's to your interpretation of where you are from and what you are standing for. And we are having different media reports about this as well. Some probably concur to what you said. Article from Financial Times said Apple and other U.S. tech companies sometimes give the impression that they could flow above national jurisdictions, notably in tax and other regulatory matters. And the commentary uh, goes on. But this is only one of those uh, media reports. Actually, media are also coming from uh, different sides when they are doing these commentaries. But I want to go back to you, Ernest, uh, very briefly from you. Where do you think this case is leading us to? How can we figure out a way to really protect the rights of citizens and also the consumers. Yeah, I think we, we need to see some companies stand up and say that they agree with the position that we're kind of articulating here. Um, you know, that they, they should be uh, assisting the government in these limited cases. Right. At the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a calculation. You can spin that to the company's benefit uh, to brand them as the protectors of uh, the security of, of everybody because they are cooperating in this war, but, but, uh, you know, against uh, uh, radicalism. But, but you know, Eric, we don't need spin doctors. We really need someone who is wholeheartedly really trying to protect the rights of the citizens and their consumers. What about solutions from you? Briefly, one sentence or two. Well, look, I, I think that, frankly, Apple has been, in this case, they're ripping off the security of the American public. I mean, how, right. what gives them the right to, to give ISIS the safe haven? I don't, I don't agree with it. I really don't, okay. not in this specific case. And, and it's unfair. It's unfair to the security of the public. All right. We heard both of your statements seem to be on the same mm -hmm. side. I tried to argue the other way as a journalist. Thank you so much, uh, Ernest McDuffie and Eric Schiffer. Thank you. Really appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you. And that is all the time for us for today. If you'd like to see more program, visit our website. Just type in World Inside CCTV News into your search engine. You will be able to find us. Or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Inside team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night and have a great weekend.